Stanford University. The brachial plexus is formed from the anterior primary rami uh, C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. This is the fifth cervical, sixth, seventh, eighth, and the first thoracic anterior primary ramus, rami. Now these rami give rise to the roots of the brachial plexus. So here is C5 root, and this unites with C6 in this fashion to form the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. The anterior primary ramus of the seventh cervical nerve passes on without joining anything and forms the middle trunk of the brachial plexus. Roots from C8 and the first thoracic unite to form the lower trunk of the plexus. Now this takes place in the posterior triangle of the neck. Each of these trunks now divides into anterior and posterior divisions. The posterior divisions will unite to form the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. The anterior divisions will pass on and the anterior division of the middle trunk will unite with the anterior division of the upper trunk to form the lateral cord of the plexus. The anterior division of the lower trunk continues as the medial cord of the plexus. So, so far, let us see what we have formed. We have the roots from the fifth cervical, sixth cervical, seventh cervical, and eighth cervical nerve, and the first thoracic nerve. The upper two roots unite to form the upper trunk. The C7 root forms the middle trunk, and the eighth and first thoracic root unite to form the lower trunk. Now these three trunks, one, two, three, divide into anterior and posterior divisions. The posterior divisions are indicated in a darker yellow, and these unite to form the posterior cord of the plexus. The anterior division of the middle trunk unites with the anterior division of the upper trunk to form the lateral cord of the plexus. And the anterior division of the lower trunk continues as the medial cord of the plexus. Now let us consider the branches from these different parts of the brachial plexus. From the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh roots, there is formed the long thoracic nerve, which descends in the posterior triangle of the neck behind the brachial plexus, and then as we've seen in this diagram, passes over the outer border of the first rib and descends over the serratus anterior as the long thoracic nerve. This is the nerve supply to this muscle, and should it be injured, then the scapula will move away from the posterior wall of the thorax, a condition known as wing scapula. So this is the long thoracic nerve, the nerve supply to serratus anterior. From the fifth cervical nerve, or the uh, fifth cervical root of the plexus, there is a little nerve here known as the dorsal scapular nerve. The dorsal scapular nerve. This will supply the levator scapulae and the rhomboid muscles. This point here is often referred to as the herbs point, the point where the fifth and sixth cervical roots unite to form the upper trunk. Here we have the suprascapular nerve, which crosses the posterior triangle and will eventually supply the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. And here is a small nerve which descends in front of the brachial plexus, and as we shall see in this diagram, crosses the front of the subclavian artery to supply the subclavius muscle. Its importance clinically is that it may contribute the fifth cervical nerve to the phrenic nerve and become an accessory phrenic nerve. Now let us consider the branches of the cords of the plexus. We have here the lateral pectoral nerve. The lateral pectoral nerve coming off the lateral cord of the plexus and supplying the pectoralis major muscle. The lateral cord, uh, this is not quite in the right position, it should be a little lower down. This lateral pectoral nerve 
uh, supplies the pectoral is major, and the remainder of this lateral cord comes on down and becomes the musculocutaneous nerve and the lateral root of the median. The medial root of the median is coming from the medial cord of the plexus. So here we have the musculocutaneous nerve, the lateral root of the median, the medial root of the median, and the median nerve. Turning now to the posterior cord of the plexus, we see that it divides into two terminal branches. One large branch, which is known as the radial nerve, and a smaller branch, which is known as the axillary nerve. There are other branches in this intermediate area, an upper and lower subscapular nerves, which supply the subscapularis muscle. In addition, the lower subscapular nerve supplies the teres major muscle. And then in the middle here, we have the thoracodorsal nerve, which passes down on the posterior wall of the axilla uh, to supply uh, the latissimus dorsi muscle. Now let us see what the branches are from the medial cord of the plexus. We have a medial pectoral nerve, which will supply the pectoralis minor and major. The medial cord gives rise to the medial root of the median, as we have seen. It also gives rise to the important ulnar nerve, which supplies all the small muscles of the hand, and gives rise to the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve and the medial brachial cutaneous nerve, which will join up with the second intercostal nerve to form the intercostal brachial nerve. So let us just review again the branches of the cords of the plexus. We have the lateral pectoral nerve coming off the lateral cord of the plexus, the musculocutaneous nerve, the lateral root of the median. Off the posterior cord of the plexus, we have the upper subscapular and the lower subscapular nerves, and we have the thoracodorsal nerve. We have the terminal branches here, the long radial nerve, the largest branch, and a smaller axillary nerve. We have from the medial cord of the plexus, the medial pectoral nerve. We have here the medial brachial nerve, which joins with the uh, second intercostal nerve to form the intercostal brachial, and we have the important ulnar nerve, and the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve. Now what we must do now is relate this brachial plexus to the axillary artery in this drawing. Let us first of all uh, be quite clear that all three cords of the brachial plexus are lateral and above the first part of the axillary artery. So I'm going to indicate here Fairly three fairly thick uh, nerves indicating the three lateral cords, the three cords of the brachial plexus lateral to the first part of the axillary artery. And of course, these nerves are going across this and are lying in a more anterior plane. These arteries are lying in front of the nerves. Now we will continue the lateral cord of the plexus downwards passes down, and so that the lateral cord is lying lateral to the second part of the axillary artery. That is that part of the axillary artery that lies behind the pectoralis minor. The, uh, in the posterior cord, which I'm going to put in a darker color, passes posterior to the second part of the axillary artery and the medial cord passes behind the artery and lies on the medial side of the second part of the axillary artery. In other words, it passes behind, crosses behind here, and lies on the medial side. So the three cords take up their, really, their correct position in relation to the artery. The lateral cord is lateral, the posterior cord becomes posterior and disappears behind the artery, and the medial cord is medial. Now let us consider the terminal branches of the lateral cord. First of all, we'll bring down the musculocutaneous nerve, and this runs down, and we shall see later, will pierce the coracobrachialis, supplying it, and will supply the muscles in the anterior compartment of the arm. The medial, uh, the, the, the uh, lateral root of the median continues down as a direct continuation of the lateral cord of the plexus, and there we're indicated in that position. Let us consider now the 
terminal part of the medial cord of the plexus. This comes down medial to the third part of the artery and is now dividing into its terminal branches. First of all, here is the medial root of the median, crossing in front of the third part of the axillary artery and joining the lateral root of the median to form the median nerve. Here is the ulnar nerve, which is lying medial to the artery and lateral to the vein. Here is the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve lying just on the anteromedial surface of the third part of the axillary artery. And here is the medial brachial cutaneous nerve which lies on the medial side of the vein and joins up with the lateral branch of the second intercostal nerve to form the intercostal brachial nerve. Now I think before we go on any further with this drawing, are there any questions? Uh, Dr. Snell, in surgery, when we do an axillary lymph node dissection, say in combination with a radical mastectomy, we're cautioned about injury to the long thoracic nerve. Would you mind repeating the anatomy of the long thoracic nerve and tell me something of the disability that results if the long thoracic nerve is injured? Yes, well the long thoracic nerve arises from the fifth, sixth, and seventh roots of the brachial plexus up in the posterior triangle, uh, the nerve then descends behind the cords of the brachial plexus and lateral to the outer border of the first rib, you will notice that it passes behind the first part of the axillary artery and then will of course pass behind the axillary vein and then runs down on the outer surface of the serratus anterior uh, lying close to that muscle and giving off branches to the different digitations of the serratus anterior. Now this muscle uh, plays a vital part in uh, the elevation of the uh, arm to a right angle in the movement of abduction and the main fibers of the serratus anterior run backwards to the inferior angle of the scapula. So it follows that if this nerve was severely damaged uh, then the inferior angle of the scapula would move backwards away from the thoracic cage uh, giving rise to the clinical syndrome known as wing scapula. The other nerve that we're cautioned about is the thoracodorsal nerve. I see you've not drawn that yet. I wonder if you'd tell us a bit about that nerve. Uh, yes, the uh, thoracodorsal nerve uh, arises from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, and this is situated behind this part of the axillary artery. And it'll run down uh, behind the medial cord of the plexus and will accompany uh, for part of its course, the subscapular artery here, which is running along the lower margin of the subscapularis, and will leave that artery to run with the tendon of the latissimus dorsi, and so follow the tendon down to the main muscle belly. It is the nerve supply to the latissimus dorsi muscle. And the disability that might result from paralysis of that nerve? Uh, well, the patient would be unable to uh, or immediately rotate, will have weakness in medial rotation of the shoulder joint, and will have weakness in adduction of the uh, shoulder joint. One other question. Uh, we frequently do brachial plexus nerve blocks by injecting local anesthetic agents at the axillary level. Could you explain how this bathes all of the major trunks of the brachial plexus? Uh, yes, I think I shall have to go back a little bit uh, in our story. Uh, you will remember that the subclavian artery emerges uh, between here the scalenus anterior tendon in front and the sclenus medius muscle behind. And these muscles are covered on the uh, outer surfaces by the prevertebral layer of deep cervical fascia. Now as this artery emerges, it carries with it a sheath derived from this prevertebral layer of deep cervical fascia and this sheath will be continued into uh, the axilla and will enclose also the uh, brachial plexus and will carry this right down to about this level. Now bearing in mind that this represents the posterior axillary fold behind here formed by the tissimus dorsi and teres major, the anterior axillary fold we haven't pla placed in position, but you can see how it would be possible to direct a needle upwards here from a syringe and by pressing the auxiliary sheath down here and injected saying 50 cc's of solution, it would be possible for this fluid 
to, with the anesthetic agent in it, to uh, diffuse up around the axillary artery and involve all the uh, main branches of the brachial plexus. Thank you very much. Well, now I think um, <coughs> we're in a position to uh, just talk a little bit about the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. Uh, we said that the posterior cord uh, was situated behind uh, the, this part of the artery. Are there any branches that we can see, any of the terminal branches? Well, the axillary nerve passes directly backwards through the quadrilateral space. In other words, it's going to go back behind here uh, between the lower border of the subscapularis and the upper border of the teres major muscle. It's going to be very closely related uh, to the lower surface of the shoulder joint. The large radial nerve will be coming down here and we can just indicate its position because it's lying behind the uh, third part of the axillary artery here and is going to pass behind the shaft of the humerus and enter the muscular spiral groove. So, we're, uh, we have discussed then the radial nerve, the axillary nerve, the thoraco uh, uh, dorsal nerve here. Now we can just put in the upper and lower uh, subscapular nerves. Uh, they come off the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, the upper subscapular nerve goes into the upper part of the subscapularis muscle and the lower subscapular nerve will come down here and supply the lower part of the subscapularis and will send a twig down to supply the teres major. So here then we have uh, the main structures that exist in the axilla, the axillary artery uh, with the brachial plexus arranged around it. Well, what I would like to do at this point is to put in the pectoralis minor muscle. You will remember that the pectoralis minor arises from the second, third, fourth, and sometimes the fifth ribs. And we can indicate its origin something like this. And it passes upwards and laterally and converges to its insertion on the tip of the coracoid process of the scapula. So we'll indicate the upper border of the pectoralis minor in this manner and the lower margin of the pectoralis minor in this manner. And now you can see the structures that lie behind the pectoralis minor. You have the second part of the axillary artery and you have the cords of the brachial plexus arranged in their correct position. In other words, the lateral cord is lateral, the medial cord is medial, and of course the posterior cord we can't see that's lying behind. So let us now rub out then the structures that lie posterior uh, to uh, the pectoralis minor. We erase here the long thoracic nerve. We erase part of the serratus anterior and the ribs to which it's attached. We come across here and we're erasing the medial cord of the brachial plexus and the second part of the axillary artery in that manner. Just emphasize those boundaries of or borders of the pectoralis minor. Origin from the second, third, fourth, and sometimes the fifth uh, rib, and the lower margin of the pectoralis minor coming up here. So here is then the pectoralis minor in position. You can see from its position that when it contracts, it will have the effect of pulling the coracoid process downwards and medially. Now, running along the upper border of the pectoralis minor, you'll notice there's an artery here, which we'll uh, just put in position. The highest thoracic artery coming off the first part of the axillary artery and running across in that manner. And then we can just see protruding above the upper border of the pectoralis minor, the thoraco uh, acromial trunk giving off its four tonal branches. Here we've just already indicated the branch coming up towards the acromion, and here we can indicate another branch coming up towards the clavicle, and we can indicate a branch coming down here over the pectoralis minor, the pectoral branch. The pectoralis minor muscle is supplied uh, by the medial and lateral pectoral nerves. Now we, uh, we can indicate the lateral pectoral nerve as passing up here and passing over the upper border of the pectoralis minor. And we can indicate here the medial pectoral nerve uh, going into the pectoralis minor at that point. 
Well, now I think we should put in uh, the clavicle. The clavicle, you remember, is a bone which extends from the acromion process across to the manubrium sterni. It is subcutaneous in its whole length, and it is, in fact, the most commonly fractured bone in the body. It articulates medially here uh, with the manubrium uh, at the uh, sternoclavicular joint, and it articulates laterally here with the acromion, the acromioclavicular joint. So I'll just indicate its uh, lateral articulation here with the acromion. The border is convex forward there, and then it's coming back here in that sort of manner. And now we can erase the structures that lie uh, posterior uh, to the clavicle. We have, you notice, the auxiliary artery and the auxiliary vein. And we can just indicate the auxiliary vein is coming down here because we're going to put in its lower part in a moment. So we can erase here the auxiliary vein, the auxiliary artery, and the cord of the brachial plexus. This is a, a bone which, as I explained, is subcutaneous throughout its uh, length, and uh, the only structures that pass over it are the platysma and the supraclavicular branches of the cervical plexus. These are cutaneous nerves. Uh, now we have the clavicle in position coming here and then articulating at this point uh, with the manubrium sterni. So now we can put in the auxiliary vein. Now the auxiliary vein begins at the lower margin of the teres major muscle down here by the union of the basilic vein and the venae comitantes of the uh, brachial artery. The vein then passes up here medial to the medial cord of the brachial plexus in front of the subscapularis muscle and of course passes behind the pectoralis minor, and then continues up here, medial to the first part of the auxiliary artery, and there, at the outer border of the first rib, it will become continuous uh, with the subclavian vein. So it begins down here at the lower margin of the subscapularis, uh, so lower margin of the teres major, and ends above at the outer border of the first rib. Well, now, it must be appreciated that not only have we ex the auxiliary vessels and the brachial plexus, uh, but we also have some important lymph nodes in the axilla. We have an anterior group which lies very close to the lower margin of the pectoralis minor, and I'm going to indicate a group of nodes running along the lower margin of the pectoralis minor. This is called the pectoral group or anterior auxiliary group of nodes, and you'll remember that this drains uh, the greater part of the mammary gland, especially the lateral part of the mammary gland. So that is the anterior or uh, pectoral group of nodes. Then we have some nodes uh, running along uh, the beginning of the auxiliary vein, and this is the lateral auxiliary group or brachial group of nodes. We have a further group that lies on the posterior wall of the axilla in front of the subscapularis muscle, and that is referred to as the posterior axillary group or subscapular group of nodes. And then, in close association with the vein itself and the artery, we have a central group of nodes, and it is the central group of nodes that receives the, the lymphatic vessels from the other groups. And so, from the central group, the lymph ultimately passes up to a group right up at the apex of the axilla on the outer border of the first rib referred to as the uh, uh, apical group of nodes. On the other diagram, on the other side, I'll just indicate uh, the position of the axillary sheath. And we will put in the axillary vein and we'll indicate the position of the auxiliary artery, lateral to the auxiliary vein. You will note 
in this diagram that the anterior wall of the axilla is formed by the pectoralis minor and in front of that the pectoralis major. But while we are looking at this diagram, I think it's advisable to indicate the position of a, a very important layer of deep fascia known as the clavipectoral fascia. Now the clavipectoral fascia extends from the lower margin of the, pect of the clavicle down to the upper margin of the pectoralis minor, splits to enclose the pectoralis minor, and then comes down as the suspensory ligament of the axilla. We should, before we put this in, we should indicate the position of the subclavius muscle, which is just underneath uh, the clavicle. It arises from the first costal cartilage in the first rib and passes upwards and laterally uh, across the axillary vein and artery to be inserted into the undersurface of the clavicle. It stabilizes this sternoclavicular joint. Now the clavipectoral fascia will pass down, it splits to enclose the uh, subclavius muscle and then splits to enclose the pectoralis minor and then comes down here as the suspensory ligament of the axilla. Now before we put the pectoralis major over the whole of this area, let us consider some muscles that lie in this area. The coracobrachialis, for example. The coracobrachialis arises from the tip of the coracoid process, which you can just see here, projecting below the clavicle, and it passes downwards and naturally, lateral to the lateral cord of the brachial plexus, and very closely related to the muscocutaneous nerve. The muscocutaneous nerve will pierce that muscle and supply it and then the muscle will pass on in this sort of manner. And of course the musculocutaneous nerve is going to go down into the front of the arm and to supply the muscles of this anterior compartment of the arm. Also arising from the tip of the coracoid process, we have the short head of the um, biceps muscle. This passes downwards and laterally and joins up with the long head, which you remember emerged from the interior of the shoulder joint. And the two heads together combine, and so we have formed the main belly of the biceps muscle. A short head arising from the tip of the coracoid process in company with the coracobrachialis, and a long head which has arisen inside the shoulder joint from the supraglenoid tubercle, emerges through an opening in the capsule, comes down and joins the short head, and so we have the main uh, muscle belly of the biceps. Notice that the biceps, as it's coming down, is going to overlap the terminal part, part of the axillary artery, because the axillary artery here is going to become the brachial artery. Well, now we're in a position to put in this pectoralis major. It arises by two heads, a clavicular head and a sternal head. The clavicular head uh, arises from the medial half of the anterior surface of the clavicle. The sternal head arises from the upper six costal cartilages, one, two, three, four, five, six, and from the adjacent part of the uh, sternum. And the two heads are going to sweep across this area and be inserted into this lateral lip of the bicipital groove. So we'll put in here, first of all, the clavicular head. And then we'll indicate the position of the lower margin of the sternal head. And you notice that the fibers are going to sweep up and pass beneath uh, the sternal fibers. Notice the structures that lie deep posterior to the uh, pectoralis major, the pectoralis minor and the axillary contents. We will now erase the structures that lie posterior to the pectoralis major. We have the axillary vessels Have a pectoral fascia. We'll just remind ourselves that in this area 
through the Kavi petrol fascia, we have the thoraco the thoraco acromial artery coming through and the lateral uh, pectoral nerve coming through to supply the under aspect of the pectoralis major. That was lying posterior. Now we'll erase the upper six ribs and their costal cartilages and the whole of the pectoralis minor and parts of the axillary vessel. So this is the sternal head of the pectoralis major. So let's just run round this margin. Sternal head, pectoralis major, and coming up here, the lower margin forming the anterior axillary fold. Here is the upper margin of the sternal head, and here is the upper margin of the clavicular head. And you notice again how these fibers from the sternal head pass posterior to the clavicular fibers. Now you can see how this muscle with this origin is going to have the effect of adducting the shoulder joint and immediately rotating it. It is supplied by the lateral pectoral nerve. Now of course the clavicular head of pectoralis major will in addition have a, a flexor action uh, on the shoulder joint. Now what about this area here? We have the clavicle, we have the tip of the acromion process up on the corner here, and we have the greater tuberosity of the humerus. What covers in this area? Well this is the uh, deltoid muscle. Now the deltoid muscle arises really by three parts. A part here from the medial, uh, from the lateral one-third rather, of the anterior surface of the clavicle, uh, from the outer surface of the acromion process out laterally here, and posterior fibers which are, ri are arising from the spine of the scapula. And these fibers are all going to pass downwards and converge to a tendon which is inserted into the deltoid tuberosity halfway down the shaft of the humerus. So let us put in then the whole of this muscle the deltoid muscle. And we will erase here the greater tuberosity of the humerus, the front of the shoulder joint, and the insertion of the pectoralis major and the separate origins of the biceps. And here's the greater tuberosity being erased, capsule of the shoulder joint, biceps. And here we have this powerful muscle, the anterior fibers, the clavicular fibers coming down and these will have the effect of flexing uh, the shoulder joint. And then we have the multipennate lateral fibers arising from the tip of the acromion process and this will have the effect of abducting the shoulder joint to a right angle. And then behind of course we'll have the fibers coming off from the spine of the scapula and they will have the effect of extending the shoulder joint. So now you can see we have a distinct triangular area here uh, bounded by the clavicle above, the pectoralis major below, and the deltoid laterally called the infraclavicular triangle. And we can still just see the uh, insertion of the pectoralis minor. And above that region is the cavipetral fascia. So that we are now in a position to bring up the cephalic vein, which passes up on the lateral side of the biceps here and then curves medially following that margin of the deltoid and then enters this infraclavicular triangle and finally pierces the clavipetral fascia to pass posteriorly into the axillary vein. So that you notice that the curve of the shoulder is due to the deltoid but is the deltoid is projected laterally by the underlying greater tuberosity of the humerus. And should you have a dislocation of the shoulder, then the humerus will be deflected downward, and then the deltoid, instead of being curved, will come off the side of the acromion process and run vertically downward. In other words, you'll lose the natural curvature of your shoulder. Well, let us just put in here the insertion of some of the fibers 
of the trapezius muscle into the upper part of the clavicle and medially uh, we put in the origin of the sternocleidomastoid muscle you remember we had a one head arising from the front of the maneuver sternal joint tendinous head here sternocleidomastoid and then lateral to that we have the origin of the clavicular origin of the sternocleidomastoid now what have we got coming across the clavicle into this pectoral region we have the supraclavicular nerves from the cervical plexus C3 and 4 coming down to supply the skin over the point of the shoulder and the skin in the upper part of the pectoral region down as far as this manubrial sternal angle we can also place in position the fibers of origin of the platysma muscle arising from the deep fascia in front of the pectoralis major and we can also put in the position of the areola and nipple which is opposite in front of rather the fourth intercostal space here is the second costal cartilage opposite the maneuver external angle third fourth so we have then the region of the nipple here with the uh, surrounding areola so that uh, the skin in this region will receive its nerve supply from perforating branches of the intercostal nerves uh, and in here bearing in mind that the axillary region the skin up in your armpit is supplied by twigs from this uh, intercostal brachial nerve joining up with the medial tenuous nerve uh, of the arm you will notice that we now have definitely formed the anterior axillary fold which is formed by the lower margin of the pectoralis major and behind we have the posterior axillary fold formed by the tissimus dorsi tendon winding round the lower margin of the teres major notice how in a patient you can palpate the axillary vessel by placing the hand up and uh, into the axilla behind the pectoralis major you can palpate the uh, neurovascular bundle the brachial plexus terminal branches the axillary artery and the axillary vein and we can also palpate along the medial side of the axillary vein the brachial group or lateral pectoral uh, lateral uh, axillary group uh, of lymph nodes well now to complete this drawing we can put in the skin coming off the trapezius over the point of the shoulder the acromion process over the deltoid and down into the arm in this sort of fashion and we can draw the skin in coming up into the axilla and covering the posterior axillary fold and so on down the lateral wall of the thorax and I would emphasize to you again that the skin of the shoulder region covering the upper half of the deltoid is supplied by the supraclavicular nerves from the anterior rami of C3 uh, and 4 whereas the skin uh, covering the lower half of the deltoid will be supplied by the axillary nerve the skin of the upper part here uh, down as far as the maneuver external angle will be supplied by the supraclavicular nerves uh, C3 and 4 whereas the skin in this region uh, will be supplied by perforating branches of the intercostal nerves the skin of the armpit is going to be supplied uh, by branches of the intercostal brachial nerve notice how the medial wall of the axilla here is formed by the thoracic cage covered on its outer surface uh, by the serratus anterior muscle notice again this important nerve the long thoracic nerve which supplies that serratus anterior notice here the uh, nerve to the latissimus dorsi which came off the posterior cord of the brachial plexus and descends and it supplies the main muscle mass the position of the nipple is extremely variable uh, normally it is in front of the fourth intercostal space the lymphatic drainage of this area is laterally into that group of nodes that lies along the lower margin of the pectoralis minor in other words to palpate these nodes one has to place one's hand upwards behind the lower margin 
of the pectoralis major. Now this group of nodes that I've described uh, drains the greater part of the mammary gland. It is only the medial half of the mammary gland that drains medially, pierces the intercostal spaces and drains into the internal thoracic nodes uh, running along the internal thoracic artery. This concludes uh, the film on the pectoral region. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.